Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful day, Lord. And Lord, a day we can gather together to worship you and to study your word. And Lord, as we worship you, we just pray that you'll be preparing our hearts to receive the message that you have for each of us, Lord. Father, as we look at faith and how our faith is to endure, even the, through the most difficult of times, keeping our eyes focused upon you, help us to learn these lessons from James, Lord. And Lord, as always, as we worship you, we just pray it comes from our hearts, that we love you so much that the, the songs we sing unto you would honor you and bless you. And Lord, again, draw us close to you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Morning, everyone. Morning, Morning everybody uh, watching us on the internet. Welcome. Uh, we will start off by sharing Psalm 71. In you, O Lord, I have taken refuge. Let me never be ashamed. In your righteousness, deliver me and rescue me. Incline your ear to me and save me. Be to me a rock of habitation to which I may continually come. You have given commandment to save me, for you are my rock and my fortress. Rescue me, O my God, out of the hand of the wicked, out of the grasp of the wrongdoer and ruthless man, for you are my hope. O Lord God, you are my confidence from my youth. By you I have been sustained from my birth. You are he who took me from my mother's womb. My praise is continually of you. I have become a marvel to many, for you are my strong refuge. My mouth is filled with your praise and with your glory all day long. Do not cast me off in the time of old age. Do not forsake me when my strength fails. For my enemies have spoken against me, and those who watched for my life have consulted together, saying, God has forsaken him. Pursue and seize him, for there is no one to deliver. O oh God, do not be far from me. O oh my God, hasten to my help. Let those who are adversaries of my soul be ashamed and consumed. Let them be covered with reproach and dishonor who seek to injure me. But as for me, I will hope continually and will praise you yet more and more. My mouth shall tell of your righteousness and of your salvation all day long. For I do not know the sum of them. I will come with mighty deeds of the Lord God. I will make mention of your righteousness. Yours alone. O oh God, you have taught me from my youth, and I still declare your wondrous deeds. And even when I am old and gray, O oh God, do not forsake me. Until I declare your strength to this generation, your power to all who are to come. For your righteousness, O oh God, reaches to the heavens, you who have done great things. O oh God, who is like you? You who have shown me many troubles and distresses will revive me again and will bring me up again from the depths of the earth. May you increase my greatness and turn to comfort me. I will also praise you with a harp, even your truth, O oh my God. To you I will sing praises with the lyre, O Holy One of Israel. My lips will shout for joy when I sing praises to you and my soul, which you have redeemed. My tongue also will utter your righteousness all day long, for they are ashamed, for they are humiliated who seek my hurt. This morning, if you would, please turn in your Bibles to James chapter 5 as we continue our study through this letter that James wrote to persecuted Jewish believers, and these people had to flee their homes because of this persecution against their faith in the Lord. And we're getting down to the nitty-gritty. We've got two more studies after this one in the book of James, and then we'll dig into the book of Joshua and do an in-depth study on that, looking at the victorious Christian life. So uh, keep that in mind. But if you've been with us through this study, it has been challenging. And the reason I say that is because James is challenging our faith. 
He wants us to go further. He wants us to grow in the Lord. He doesn't want us to remain immature or carnal in our walk with the Lord. And he just doesn't want this to be information that we take into our lives. He wants this to be applied to our lives. In fact, he said in James 1.22, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. And James, like we said, he starts out really hard. You know, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. In James chapter 1, the whole focus was the believer in suffering. And as he move on, moves on, he doesn't pull any punches. He speaks of how our lives should manifest good works, that we are to treat people the same, not put a person above another because they have a better status in society or whatever. And he says, you know, but do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? And you get the idea that they didn't want to hear this. They weren't interested in this. They were very happy in the way they were, and yet James is challenging them to go forward and let your love for the Lord be seen in the things that you do. In other words, James chapter 2, the focus was the believer in service. As he continues on, this is probably one of the hardest chapters, kind of hits us right between the eyes. He speaks about our speech, the words that we say, and he shows us that our words, like a little fire, can destroy a forest. Our speech, the words we say, can destroy lives. In fact, he put it like this in James 3, verses 8 through 10. But no man can tame the tongue. It's an unruly evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless our God and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. And that's really the reality. The challenge is not to let your words curse people, but to bless them. And the focus was the believer in his speech in James chapter 3. Well, if that wasn't hard enough, he moves on and he speaks of how we're to be separated from the world. And when I speak of the world, I speak about the world that is in opposition to God. And to do this, James shows us where wars come from, why we fight amongst each other. And it was the flesh, the world, the devil, all working together. And really, the flesh, the world, the devil will use to cause us to fight with each other. And his point was simple. He said in James 4.4, 4, adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Don't compromise your faith to fit in with what the world is saying. And isn't that the pressure today? To compromise what we believe so the world will like us. And I guarantee you it's going to get a lot tougher. I was talking with Tim, uh, who spoke on Thursday. And he was sharing one of the things that the uh, Chinese government is doing. This is not secret information. This is out on Facebook. It's everywhere. And they're rating people, like on Facebook. So if you don't agree with me, you're not a nice person, you treat me unfairly, you get a one out of five. And if you get a one, your job status is in trouble. The food you purchase, the friends you have. Isn't that interesting how a government is using social media to rate people? Think about in the tribulation period. Or think about not even in the tribulation period. Think in a few years. Because don't we like to get liked on Facebook? We like those likes. We want to get more. Here's the thing. So you are against homosexuality. You are against abortion. I'm going to give you a one. And what if it affected your job status? What if it affected your relationships? What are you going to do? Oh, no, I accept homosexuality. Oh, no, I accept abortion because I don't want my job in trouble. I don't. You see the pressure that can be placed upon us. Friendship with the world is enmity with God. Huge. And we talked about in James 4, the believer in the separated life. We last week started in James chapter 5, and it deals really with our perspective of things which causes us to live out our faith, or not. You see, the perspective we have is going to determine how we live, and it should make sense. The focus here is the believer in the second coming, and I like that. You know, 
our first study here in James 5, we focus on the sins of the rich. And not just picking on the rich, of course. There are many people in the scriptures who were very wealthy, very rich, and were very godly. That wasn't the issue that we were talking about. And secondly, and probably more important, as you compare what Americans have with the rest of the world, all of us are rich. So it's a warning to us. And we got to keep in mind, money isn't moral, and it's not immoral. It's amoral. It's neutral. And it could be used for moral or immoral purposes. And that could be the problem. And, and James is speaking of those whose money really was their God. Those who are living like this life was all there is, and li- there's no life beyond the grave. And he had some pretty strong words of condemnation for them. And I don't believe he's speaking of believers here, but I think it can be applied to our lives. I think it's important we understand that. I'm just going to read these verses in James 5, verses 1 through 6. We covered them last time, but it kind of is getting us into the verses we're going to be looking at this morning. Listen to what James says, starting in verse 1 of James chapter 5. Come now, you rich, weep and howl for your miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver are corroded, and their corrosion will be a witness against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have heaped up treasure in the last days. Indeed, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, cry out. And the cries of the reapers have reached the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. You have lived on the earth in pleasure and luxury. You have fattened your hearts as in the day of slaughter. You have condemned, you have murdered the just. He does not resist you. The idea here is these poor Christians, as well as unsaved people who were poor, were being taken advantage by the rich. And I I, I think what James is trying to do here is to encourage the believers. Because it's it's easy to lose hope, even for Christians. We can lose hope because we can keep our eyes focused on worldly things instead of a heavenly one. And James says, you know, judgment is coming upon those who have rejected Christ, the unbelievers. And for believers, we'll we'll come face to face with the Lord, our Savior. Now, hope is an important thing. And, you know, you look at our world today, and isn't that something that's missing? I mean, you turn on the news and you think, like, everything is horrible, right? I mean, do you really hear a lot of good news today? No, it doesn't sell. Bad news sells. Um, I, I just listened to a little excerpt from Paul Harvey back from 1965. And the things he spoke about that will destroy a country, and every one of them has happened to America. So prophetic in nature. It's almost scary. So you know, it's like Paul Harvey just read did that the other day, but he didn't. That was back in 1965. I encourage you take a look at that. But let me share this article with you. Americans have lost faith in pretty much everything. It was back from 2016, June 14th, and this is what it said: The people of the United States have pretty much had it with the country's major institutions, as faith in everything from the banks and newspapers to organize religion and TV news has taken a big hit in recent years, according to a recent Gallup poll. As Gallup's Jim Norman explains, Americans clearly lack confidence in the institutions that affect their daily lives. The schools responsible for educating the nation's children, the hours of worship that are expected to provide spiritual guidance, the banks that are supposed to protect Americans' earnings, the U.S. Congress elected to represent the nation's interests, and the news media that claims to exist to keep them informed. Since 2006, Americans have lost confidence in 10 of the 14 major institutions. The banks, understandably, have taken the brunt of it, with the percentage of those having a great deal or quite a lot of confidence dropping from 49% to 27% since 2006. Organized religion endured the scandals of the Catholic Church to drop from 52% to 41%. Newspapers declined by 10 percentage points that hit an all-time low. Television News and Congress both saw their confidence ratings drop by double digits as well. Can you imagine? Double digits, your ratings have dropped and you still have a job. Go figure that one, right? It makes no sense. 
Congress actually earned the ignominious distinction of being the only institution sparking little or no confidence in a majority of Americans in the poll. Yeah, that's pretty obvious, right? I don't even think you need to take a poll on that one. Meanwhile, the military is held steady at 73%, beating out the police in the number two spot at 56%. The loss of faith in so many at one time, while Americans are becoming more positive in other ways, suggests there are reasons that reach beyond the individual institution, Norman said. The task of identifying and dealing with those reasons in a way that rebuilds confidence is one of the more important challenges facing the nation's leaders in the years ahead. There is the problem, guys. The task of identifying and dealing with those reasons in a way that rebuilds confidence is one of the more important challenges facing the nation's leaders in the years ahead. I do not believe this is a problem for our government or whoever. This is for the church. And I think one of the problems is we have misrepresented the Lord so badly that people have a bad taste in their mouth about Christianity, about the Lord, and that should not be. We got these guys on TV that, you know, keep asking for more and more money, and people watch that, they see it, it's on the news. And they go, that's Christianity. Look, they're just ripping people off. It's, it's, that Christianity is like anything else. No, it's not. Because that is not what our Lord did, called us to do. You see, our hope in our Lord doesn't fade away. It will not go away, and it will not change. The wonderful thing about our Lord is when he makes a promise, it's a done deal, it's going to take place. When a politician says, I'm going to do this, how much hope do you have? We've seen it over and over again. To get into office, they'll say anything, very sadly. So as we read God's word, we can get a perspective of things, and that correct perspective, I think, changes everything for us. And we, you know, think about it. We see a lot of anger today, even among Christians. You know, Facebook, again, is an interesting, interesting social media spot. Because some of the posts I read, I question some of these people's faith. Why are they so angry? Oh, well, maybe one of the reasons is they lost the perspective. They've lost hope. And they lash out at others, really. I mean, I don't know. Before I was a Christian, I was a pretty nice guy and according to worldly standards. But I wasn't a Christian. My values were different than they are today. But what about the government? What about, you know, the liberal agenda? What about this? That's what we fight against, right? Well, I thought we're supposed to bring the gospel message to a lost and dying world. Now, I can go in and I can wipe out all kinds of people, right? Is that going to solve the problem? No, there's just more people coming. But what if these people come to saving faith? They have a new nature now. They've changed. God saved them. And isn't that what we desire? You see, we think the government's going to change everything. I don't have a lot of hope. I'm sorry. You know, forgive me. I don't have a lot of hope in the government doing a whole lot. We're moving to a one-world you know, government. I understand, you know, Trump has stopped that a little, but it's only temporary. We'll still be moving towards it. My hope is in individuals. As people get saved, they will change others around them because they will reproduce. Healthy sheep reproduce. They tell others of Jesus. Others get saved. They tell others of Jesus. They get saved. All of a sudden, you've got families. You've got communities. You've got a state of believers. What a difference that would make. You see, we've lost the perspective. We will pour billions of dollars into elections. And we haven't changed a thing. Pour billions of dollars into bringing the gospel message to a lost and dying world. Wow! What could happen? What can God do? If we were on our knees praying, I don't even think the money is the issue. I think the issue is a surrendering of the heart. Being on our knees and praying for our nation. For the people in our communities. For our families and so on. I've called this study this morning, Faith Endures. And really, that's how true faith should be. That no matter what comes our way, and we're going to face difficult things, our faith is going to endure to the end. We need to finish the race strong and be an example. A light to a world that has lost hope, and they've become very angry and very vengeful. Haven't you seen that today? The people are very angry at everything. 
if you differ in a, you know, what they believe, people get angry. Well, can we have a difference of opinion? We're not going to agree on everything. I mean, let's face it, you guys love the Packers, I love the Bears. Tony loves the Bears. We're trying to get Larry to love the Bears. I don't know if that's going to work. We, we differ. We have fun with it, right? But it's not the end of the world. But some things we fight over and argue. Why? I'm not going to change you. I, I want you to see. The, I want you to come to, to Jesus. I mean, remember Paul before Festus and Agrippa. I mean, he just poured his heart out to them. I wish you were saved. I wish you were like me, but not in these chains. I mean, that's what that's the heart of Paul, and that should be our heart to see people saved. But boy, if we lose the perspective of what's going on and focus on this world, we're going to be very disheartened. I've broken these verses down we're going to be looking at this morning into four main points. Patience in nature in James 5, 7. Perspective for patience in James 5, verses 8 and 9. Examples of patience, James 5, 10 through 11. And patience seen in how we live in James 5, 12. And again, you know, remember how James started out this whole letter by speaking of enduring trials that we face with joy because these trials are working in our lives and helping us to grow, to mature in the faith. And they're giving us patience as we need that to keep our, and we need that to keep our eyes on the Lord in the midst of the storms of life. So with that as our introduction, let's pick up James chapter 5, starting in verse 7, and look at this topic of faith endures. James said, Therefore be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and later rain? Now, before we look at this illustration that James has given us here in this verse, uh, patience in nature, I want to deal with the word patience. He uses this word two times in this verse, once in verse 8, and I think we need to understand what it means. Remember back in, in chapter 1, verses 2 through 4, where you know, he said, My brother, count it all joy. When you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. The Greek word for patience there was hupomone, and it literally means to remain under, having endurance under great stress or per persevering under pressure, staying put, standing fast, even though you know we'd like to run away. But that's not the word that James uses here. In verse uh, 7 here in James chapter 5, it's a Greek word that carries with it the idea of long-suffering or long-tempered. And think of these two Greek words, one back in chapter 1 and the words here in chapter 5, like this. In James chapter 1, the patience that's spoken of is related to difficult situations. That we are to count it all joy when things come upon us, not running away. But here in chapter 5, the patience that is spoken of is related to people. That we are to endure what others do to us and be long-suffering in spite of these things. That's a tough one. But you don't know what they did to me. Is our Lord long-suffering? Wow, is He long-suffering. Look at what the world has done unto Him. How they mock and put Him down and dishonor the king of kings. And yet he's long-suffering. And that's what James is calling us to do. It's tough. He, he wants us to grow. He wants us to mature. And we need to have patience towards others. You know, I get blasted on Facebook from time to time. And, you know, I, I kind of have learned to just let it go and let the Lord deal with it. And it's amazing how the Lord does deal with it. It's kind of fun to watch sometimes. I don't think anyone likes to get blasted, but it is what it is. And when it's from a Christian, it's even sadder to me. And then that's what I've come to believe is, wow, Lord, my heart breaks because here is this person who's supposed to be a Christian and now is putting public all his anger. Interesting. And the Lord always ends up taking care of it, which, you know, it's a matter of learning to trust in him. Now, Think about what happens to us in this country. 
and compare it to what happens to our brothers and sisters throughout the world, especially in Muslim nations. The slaughter of families, communities, because of their faith in Christ. And they're patient, they endure the suffering, and God is saying, you need to endure. You need to be long-suffering. And, you know, when we respond in anger and hate and all this, you know, let this verbal attack go on, is that the fruit of the Spirit? Think about it. No, it's not. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. The only way the fruit of the Spirit is going to flow from your life is when you surrender your life to the Lord. You crucify the flesh. Because isn't it interesting, when someone rubs you the wrong way, what comes up first? The flesh. You're ready to respond. And I'm telling you, you know, I'm not a very quick person, but when someone says something to me, man, I can lash out just like that. It's like, wow, that was faster than anything. And it's learning to Give it to the Lord and let Him speak through you. Surrendering to Him. And again, it's difficult. It's not easy. That's why we have to bring it before the Lord. That's why we have to crucify the flesh. And if you don't, then the works of the flesh are manifested in our lives. And it's not pretty and it's not honoring to the Lord. And, And James is showing us with this illustration of a farmer. You know, a farmer who plants his crop and waits patiently for it to grow, to mature until he can harvest it. You know, he doesn't plant it one day, get up the next day and expect, you know, it to be growing. We had this huge tree removed from our yard last year and they took out the stump earlier this year. And I put a bunch of dirt down to fill in the the hole and I put grass seed down, got up the next morning, there's no grass there. The next morning, no grass there. I was impatient. It was kind of interesting how it just fit in with this study. I'm going, man, how long is it going to take to grow? It's been, you know, 36 hours. <laughs> but that's how we are sometimes, isn't it? And it's not that he only waits for the fruit to come, but he waits also for the rain to fall and help the crops to grow, the early rains that came in October or early November to soften the ground for planting, and the latter rains in late April or May that help them crops to mature before the harvest. And James is saying he wants us to learn patience through this, that God will send the rains as they are needed in our lives to prepare for his return. And it's not easy because we see all the injustices that go on in this world, even against us, and it's hard. This is from April 21st, 2018, and it's interesting, it's an article about how this nation is turning against Christians. And it goes like this, how long will I be allowed to remain a Christian? This was the deeply dismaying question posed to me by a friend with four young children as we discussed the plight of the Christian faith in America and around the world. With each passing month, that shocking question becomes more relevant and more disturbing. To say that Christians and Christianity are under a withering and brutal attack in certain areas of the world would be an understatement. In various parts of the Middle East, there is a genocidal cleansing of Christians being carried out. Women, men, and their young children are being slaughtered because of their faith, and world leaders and most of the media turn their backs in bored indifference. Here in the United States, Christians and Christianity are mocked, belittled, smeared, and attacked by some on a daily basis. This is a bigoted practice that is not only increasing exponentially, but is being encouraged and sanctioned by a number on the left. To many of those who worship at the altar of political correctness have deemed that Christianity should no longer be respected. Rather, they assail it on a regular basis in a coordinated campaign to weaken the faith and its base. The prevailing view in much of the media is that Christianity is aligned with Republicans, conservatives, or the views of President Trump, and therefore must be diminished and made suspect. The New Yorker just described the opening of a few Chick-fil-A restaurants in New York City as pervasive Christian traditionalism and a creepy infiltration of New York City. This is a restaurant. They sell chicken. <laughs> and it's, they're creepy? I, you know, it, isn't it interesting, though? Why? Because they're Christian. It's a Christian business. 
you know, I, I can't remember um, where this was at in the country, um, but there was a catastrophe that happened. And, you know, Chick-fil-A restaurants are closed on Sunday. They honor the Lord, and they're closed on Sunday. But they were making sandwiches and handing them out on a Sunday because there was a need for people. They are creepy, aren't they? How evil are these people? But see, that's the mentality. You know, you put misinformation out there, and guess what? People believe it. He goes on, Christianity is an infiltration to some on the left. In college, they now teach about the evils of Christian privilege. On Broadway and in theaters around the world, mocking Christians has become a massively profitable money-making venture. In name, on the cross, and in art, Jesus Christ is desecrated in the most twisted and obscene of ways. In movies, on television, and online, Christians are portrayed in the most dishonest, prejudiced, and insulting ways. Across the country, Christian colleges are under constant assault from social justice warriors seeking to strip their accreditation and put them out of business. Christian groups on campus are at times being persecuted, their offices and handouts vandalized, and members even, be, even being physically assaulted. In a nation that is still a majority Christian, those who follow the faith have been litigated or browbeaten into being fearful to other words, Merry Christ Christmas, or to display a nativity scene celebrating the one and only reason there is a Christmas day. Want to stay true to your Christian faith in the most innocuous and giving of ways? To do so is becoming more perilous by the minute. When you stop to ponder just a sampling of the negative consequences, for example, a high school football coach is fired for taking a knee in prayer. Really. I mean, what? no one has to look at him or say anything. A teacher is fired for giving a Bible to a student who requested it. A Marine is cursed at and then court-martialed for not removing a Bible verse from her computer. Another Bible verse posted by sailors at a military hospital is labeled extremism. If you're a practicing Christian in the United States and open about it, you, your congregation, and your organizations will become a target of some sort. It's just a matter of time. Ironically, in some very real and ominous ways, it's as if we're being transported back to ancient Rome. Will we soon have to meet with fellow Christians in secret? Will we have to whisper our beliefs from the shadows? Will those Christians with traditional beliefs lose their jobs and livelihoods if discovered? As more and more of the mainstream media, entertainment, academia, and the high-tech world continue to purge or discriminate against Christians, what future job fields will be open to young Christians? Will those Christian children eventually be forced to renounce or deny their faith in order to get a job and provide for their families? It kind of corresponds to what I talked about going on in China today. You say you're a Christian? I'm sorry, we can't hire you. Now, as hard as that is to swallow, should we be surprised by these things? No, because we know in the last days, things are going to grow more and more wicked. And as that happens, those who are opposed to the immorality that's taking place are going to be attacked. It's what we're seeing today. I mean, really, think about it. We stand up for the unborn. We are pro-life. And people fight against it. Go figure that one. Really? We, we're, we're fighting for the unborn that doesn't have a voice. And you're upset at me. It makes no sense. And the, the ra how irrational this is, if I murdered a woman that was pregnant, there would be two murders that I've done in the court system. Well, how does that work? I didn't think that was a life. You see how irrational it is? It makes no sense. And for us, you know, what do we do? Well, like a farmer, you have to cultivate the field. You Pray for those who are doing these things. And you plant the seed of God's word into their hearts. You share the word of God with them. And then you wait for the water of the Holy Spirit to cause the seed to grow. That they come to saving faith. And you have to be patient for the harvest to come. And the main point James is driving home is how believers can learn patience by first cultivating the proper mindset in serving the Lord. Again, you know, you don't plant the seed and expect the crops to be growing the next day. It takes time. You have to be patient. 
you know, Spurgeon put it like this. He said, a man to whom it is given to wait for a reward keeps up his courage. And when he has to wait, he says, it is no more than I expected. I never reckoned that I was to slay my enemy at the first blow. I never imagined that I was to capture the city as soon as, uh, as ever I dig the first trench. I reckoned upon waiting, and now that has come. I find that God gives me the grace to fight on and wrestle on till the vic victory shall come. And patience saves a man from a great deal of haste and folly. Absolutely. You know, again, it is easy to lose hope when you look at all the injustices that are happening in this world. And for the persecuted believers who were enduring hardships because they loved the Lord, James is telling them, and I believe he's telling us, you know, hang in there. Why? Because the Lord's return is getting close. The Lord's coming back. You know, Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, 58 said, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil, your labor, is not in vain in the Lord. You know, we look at it, oh, this is a monumental task. Well, if it was easy, why do we need the Lord? Do you ever think about that? If it was easy, we, didn't, we wouldn't need him. But it is, it's a monumental task. It's beyond anything we could ever imagine. And we say, Lord, help us. Help us to minister the gospel to a lost and dying world that they can receive that hope, that joy that only comes from knowing you. Galatians 6, 9, Paul said, Let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Do we grow weary? Yeah. Isn't it hard sometimes? You go, you just shake your head. Ah, oh, nothing's happening. Did God stop working? Just because you don't see the things happening that you think you want to see, doesn't mean God's not working. He is. Be patient. The harvest is going to come. The crop's going to grow, but you've got to be patient. And you, you can't just give up. I, I remember a story, and I, I probably won't get it totally correct. I'm not going to tell you where it happened. It was somewhere out west. A guy had this gold mine, and he was digging for gold. And it didn't really get much of anything. And he finally just decided to sell it. It was just, you know, it was not worth it. And the guy bought it, and he was within inches, I think it was, of the biggest gold mine in America, within inches. What happened? He grew weary in the work, and he gave up. And that was a lesson for me. Don't ever give up. Don't grow weary. Continue on. You don't know what's going to happen. You don't know the fruit that's going to be born from this. God does because he knows everything. And what does he tell me? Don't grow weary. Your labor is not in vain. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. And He's coming back. Oh, yeah. Changes everything. So nature, patience in nature, learning that, leads to the next point, perspective for patience. And again, it deals with the Lord's return. Look at verse 8 of James 5. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. Isn't perspective important? And having the right perspective, the correct perspective, is truly important. You know, as you listen to the news, as you read the newspapers, you think everything is a mess. There's nothing good. The world's coming to an end. And, I, you know, I guess it is. You know, God's Word tells us, but not like the world is telling us. You see, what they're saying is not true. And I realize this is tough. Some of you may be thinking, you know, what are you talking about? Do you know what's going on in the Middle East with Syria, Russia, Iran? Do you see Turkey, how they turned against Israel now, just as the scriptures say? Part of Ezekiel's 38 and 39 invasion against Israel. Do you see the wickedness in this country? Do you see how the church is compromising what they believe and embracing Roman Catholicism now, the Protestant church, for a one-world religion? Our nation working to become part of a one-world government. Things are a mess, Pastor Joe. What's wrong with you? Well, you know, I'm not going to deal with that issue, what's wrong with me. We don't have time, but we've we got to move on. But the Lord's coming back. You know, if that's the one thing you take from the lesson this morning, the Lord is coming back. That's a pretty big one, isn't it? Oh, yeah, there's my perspective. This is bad, but he's coming back. 
So my hope is in him, that no matter what happens out here, he's going to see me through. Yeah. And maybe for some of us, the reason we're in such turmoil regarding everything that is going on is because we haven't established that in our hearts. He's coming back. He's going to take care of all the injustices that have taken place and will take place. Things are not out of control. They are going according to the plans of God found in the Word of God, and that gives us the correct perspective of things. And I'm not saying we don't grieve over the things we see, but things aren't always going to be like they are now. And there's only two things. Either the Lord's going to return before we die, or we're going to die and go to be with Him one day, right? Either way, is it a win-win situation? Absolutely it is. Perspective. It's a perspective. All believers are headed for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Praise the Lord for that, right? I mean, that changes everything. And Spurgeon said, when God shall give you a rich return for all you have done for him, you will blush to think you ever doubted. You will be ashamed to think you ever grew weary in his service. You shall have your reward. Not tomorrow, so wait. Not the next day, perhaps, so be patient. You may be full of doubts one day. Your joys sink low. It may be rough, windy weather with you in your spirit. You may even doubt whether you are the Lord's. But if you have rested in the name of Jesus, if by the grace of God you are what you are, if he is all your salvation and all you desire, have patience, have patience, for the reward will surely come in God's good time. Absolutely. Keep your eyes on the Lord. He's coming back. In fact, that phrase, the coming of the Lord, coming is the Greek word paraza. It speaks of his arrival, not the rapture of the church, but his coming back to establish his kingdom. And that should just make sense. Because when the judge of all the earth returns, when he comes back, he's going to establish his kingdom on this earth and righteousness will fill this land. The problem comes when things heat up and our response is, like James tells us, grumble against one another. And he says, do not do that. Do not grumble against one another, brother, unless you be condemned. When things heat up, when tough times come, when pressure increases in our lives, we grumble against each other. We're critical of one another. We groan and complain. And yes, we can grumble against the brother, and if we're doing that, I'm sure we're grumbling against the unsaved as well. We're just grumbling. What's the perspective? Behold, the judge is standing at the door. Oh yeah, the judge is standing at the door. You see, we're all going to appear, all believers are going to appear before the judgment seat of Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.10 For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. One writer put it like this. He said, James was writing to people in such a miserable state that they were easily at each other's throats. Close pressure had made them jumpy and quick to take offense. This had to stop. So James focused the imminency of Christ's return on the problem. For Christ's imminent return meant that Christ, the great judge of all, was right at the door. Amen to that. You know, have a correct perspective of things. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Look up because he's coming. Be patient. You know, we have seen patience in nature. Now, this correct perspective for patience. Here comes the judge, you might say. And now James is going to share with us examples of patience. It's always good to see examples to encourage us in the faith. Look at James 5, verses 10 and 11. My brethren, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering and patience. Indeed, we count them blessed to endure. You have heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. You know, it's, life is not easy, guys, and we can lose perspective so quickly. You know, we may be so battered and beaten up that we're, you know, singing, you know, nobody knows the trouble I've been through, nobody knows my sorrow, nobody knows the trouble I've seen, right? And we just end there, that's it. Lost all hope, it's over. And we keep going down and down and down because we lost that hope. Let me say this, that's not how the song goes, completely. 
That's what we remember. Isn't it interesting? That's what we remember of the song. Nobody knows this trouble I've seen. It's bad. Well, I'll share with you how the song goes. Nobody knows the trouble I've been through. Nobody knows my sorrow. Nobody knows the trouble I've seen. Glory, hallelujah. Is that interesting? Sometimes I'm up, sometimes I'm down. Oh, yes, Lord. Sometimes I'm almost to the ground. Oh, yes, Lord. Although you see me going long so, oh, yes, Lord. I have my trials here below. Oh, yes, Lord. If you get there before I do, oh, yes, Lord. Tell all my friends I'm coming to heaven. Oh, yes, Lord. Wow, what a great perspective to have, huh? Again, you know, we just know the bad parts of the song, the sorrows, the troubles I've seen. It's so bad. Glory, hallelujah. Okay, Lord, I'm coming home one day. The correct perspective. If we take that out about the Lord, we lose all hope. And James is reminding us, hey guys, remember the Old Testament prophets? Remember the things they had to endure in their life. The sufferings they had. The hardships. And yet, they endured until the end. And James, again, giving us these examples to help us in our walk with the Lord, to mature in the faith, to grow. And he's basically saying, you know, hey guys, I know it's tough. I know it's hard. I know the persecution is growing. Hang in there. And not only is the Lord coming back, but look at the examples of the prophets and what they endured for their faith. May that be an encouragement to you. I mean, think about Jeremiah. You know, I, I always feel bad for Jeremiah. I know a lot of people feel bad for Job. He, he had a rough life, and James talks about him. But Jeremiah was a tough guy. Forty years of ministry, right? What did he get out of it? Did you ever think about that? He was put in stocks. He was thrown into prison. He was put in a muddy dungeon. And in the end, no one listened to him. They mocked him, and yet he persevered in the ministry until the end. You know, it's interesting because, you know, the health, wealth, and prosperity teachers love to focus on the... the uh, Hebrews 11, the hall of faith. There's wonderful things. But they leave out what other prophets, what other men of God and women of God had to endure. In verses 35 through 38 of Hebrews 11, this is what we're told. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. Still others had trial of mockings and scourgings. Yes, and of chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains and dens and caves of the earth. And James is telling us, go back, guys. You're Jews, you know the scriptures. Look at what? The Old Testament prophets, the Old Testament men and women, what they endured for their faith in the true and living God. And then he talks about Job, you know, who lost his business, his livestock, his servants, his family, and finally his health. He lost it all. And yet God wasn't punishing him. God was teaching him lessons of faith through this as he suffered. He was testing his faith. In fact, in Job 42, verses 10 through 13, and then verses 16 through 17, this is what we're told. The Lord restored Job's losses when he prayed for his friends. Indeed, the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Then all his brothers, all his sisters, and all those who had been his acquaintance before came to him and ate food with him in his house. And they consoled him and comforted him for all the adversity that the Lord had brought upon him. Each one gave him a piece of silver and each a ring of gold. Now the Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than his beginning, for he had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, and 1,000 female donkeys. He also had seven sons and three daughters. Verse 16 says, And after this Job lived 140 years and saw his children and grandchildren for four generations. So Job died old and full of days. That was compassionate and merciful to him. You know, Sometimes persecution ends when the Lord brings us home. And again, we don't lose anything. We're with the Lord. That's the perspective we have to have. For Job, God ended up blessing him. But that's the blessing of going home to be with him is a blessing also, right? 
Warren Worsby, Worsby kind of sums it all up. I love what he says about this example of Job. The book of Job is a long book, and the chapters are filled with speeches that, to the Western mind, seem long and tedious. In the first three chapters, you have Job's distress. He loses his wealth, his family, except for his wife, and she told him to commit suicide. <laughs> Thanks, hon. And his health, <laughs> in Job 4, 4 verses, or chapter 4 through chapter 31, we read Job's defense as he debates with his three friends and answers their false accusations. And Job 38 through 42 presents Job's deliverance. First God humbles Job and then he honors Job and gives him twice as much as he had before. In studying the experience of Job, it's important to remember that Job did not know what was going on behind the scenes between God and Satan. Job's friends accused him of being a sinner and a hypocrite. There must be some terrible sin in your life, they argued, or God would never have permitted this suffering. Job disagreed with them and maintained his innocence, but not perfection during the entire conversation. The friends were wrong. God had, not cause, had no cause against Job, and in the end, God rebuked the friends for telling lies about Job. It's difficult to find a greater example of suffering than Job. Circumstances were against him, for he lost his wealth and his health. He also lost his beloved children. His wife was against him. She said, curse God and die. His friends were against him. They accused him of being a hypocrite, deserving the judgment of God. And it seemed like God was against him. When Job cried out for answers to his questions, there was no reply from heaven. And yet he endured. Satan predicted that Job would get impatient with God, abandon his faith, and it didn't happen. And yet, Job questioned God's will, but Job didn't forsake his faith in the Lord. Though he slay me, I will hope in him. Nevertheless, I will argue my ways before him. And you've got to love that about this man named Job. He persevered to the end. What a great example. David, in Psalm 27, 13, and 14, said, I would have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Wow, what a great perspective to have. I would have lost heart if I didn't believe that I would see goodness come from God. Isn't that true? I mean, if we felt that God's done... What hope would there be? There would be absolutely none. But I know God is going to show goodness towards us. His will is going to be done in our lives. And boy, that's great encouragement. Correct perspective. The goodness of God. And in the end, He's coming back. And so perspective is everything. And the example of men and women of God in the Bible and really onward can encourage us in the faith to endure until the end. And James ends this section, patience seen in how we live, in verse 12 of James chapter 5. But above all, my brethren, do not swear, either by heaven or by earth or with any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no, no, lest you fall into judgment. These words are very similar to what our Lord said in Matthew chapter 5. He said, but I say to you, do not swear at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by earth, for it is footstool, nor by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Nor shall you swear by your head, because you cannot make one hair white or black, but let your yes be yes and your no, no, for whatever is more than these is from the evil one. Why was that such a big deal? Because like today, many say that they're going to do something, and in the end, they don't do it. And for the Jews, many Jewish people at the time James wrote this letter had made distinctions between binding oaths and non-binding oaths. Very good at that. You see, if you didn't include the name of God in your oath, it wasn't binding. So it's kind of like, yeah, I'll do that. And you got my your fingers crossed, your toes crossed, your legs crossed, everything crossed. That's a lie. And that's what James is condemning. That was kind of oaths. And I think, well, what in the world does that have to do with what we've been talking about here in James? How does this relate to patience that we see in nature, or having the correct perspective of patience, or even examples of patience in the scriptures. And what does speaking oaths have to do with the problem of suffering even? Maybe James is referring back to what he was saying in the beginning of this chapter when he spoke about the wealthy who caused the poor, those who were working for them, um, they didn't pay them. 
And so these poor people didn't have any money. They couldn't buy food. It was horrible. They took advantage of them. Even when they were taken to court to get their money, these rich people paid the judge off and they lost the case. And so we can hurt others when we say we're going to do something and we don't. We've got to keep our word. And here's the thing. Why in the world does a person have to swear to make an oath? Why does one have to say, I swear to God I'm going to do this? Because they're liars. <laughs> That's the only way. If your yes can't be yes and your no, no. If you have to say, I swear to God I'm going to do it. That's a red flag to me. Okay? When you tell someone you're going to do something, you do it. As Christians, we should have the best work ethics in the world. And what James is basically saying is, look, in the light of the Lord's return, live a life of integrity. You should be different than the world, right? Do what you say, do it because the righteous judge is coming back. You know, John in 1 John 3, verses 1 through 3 said, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the children of God. Therefore the world does not know us because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are children of God and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. Again, look at all that God has done for us. His love that he pours upon our lives. That we are as children and God is working in us to make us more like him. And he's coming back. So live your life accordingly. Let people see the love of God in you. You know, having our yes be yes or no be no, it's just simple, isn't it? Why do we make it complicated? That was one thing that my dad always taught, you know, taught me growing up. You know, when he, you know, he worked for the post office for many, many years and he also did side jobs. He was really good building things. I lost that gene. You're laughing? No, but I did lose that gene. I don't know what happened to it. Uh, it's gone somewhere, but I cannot. I, I can, if someone tells me how to do something, I can pretty much do it. But yeah, I just don't have that ability. But my dad, if he's quote a price, say, yeah, I can do this for you for this amount of money. That's the amount of money he, he did. He, if it cost him more, that was his loss. When, you know, he, we didn't have a lot of money growing up and he would take some side jobs and uh, in the evening he would clean office buildings. And I think it must have been on a Friday night he would take me because the school nights, it got pretty late. And the one thing I noticed, man, this guy worked hard. It didn't matter that there was no one else in the building. And that was really scary being a young kid, the only one in an office building. And that's when you could smoke in the office. So ashtrays, cigarette butts, everywhere, right? My dad, everything was clean. He took great honor in the work he did. Well, shouldn't that be us as Christians? Absolutely. When people see our work, they should be as, wow. Let our yes be yes, our no be no. The Lord's coming back. Don't you want to be honoring him when, you're, when he comes back? Absolutely. So, as I close this morning, we have looked at patience in nature and how the farmer has to be patient and work hard. He has to prepare the soil and plant the seeds, wait for the rains, and then wait for the harvest. And we do the same as we're out in this world ministering to the people. Patience, or perspective of patience. The Lord's coming back. The world's passing away and our eyes need to be on the eternal. All the persecution, all the difficulty we face in this life is short-lived. The judge is coming, and he's going to deal with the injustices that have been perpetrated upon mankind. And think about how fast life is going by. Do you know next week is August? What happened? It was like a blink. I mean, I, I'm thinking, i got to work on the prophecy update for New Year's Eve, because it'll be here before I know it. And guys, get ready for vacation Bible school, right? <laughs> That's how fast things are going. It's so crazy. It's like we're in a time war. Lord's coming back. Examples of patience. 
man, Job and the many, the Old Testament, New Testament, men and women of God, how they endured. I mean, I look at Paul and I'm just amazed at all that he went through. And his focus, he knew where he was going. He's going home to be with the Lord. His focus was always bringing the gospel message. He was in Lystra. He was stoned to death. They killed him. He was there on the ground. I believe he was dead. And then all of a sudden, God brought him back. And he got up. And I'm sure that, you know, the men who were around him looking at him, his fellow believers were like, oh my gosh, we got to get you out of here, Paul. No, I'm going back into the city. How do you stop a guy like that? You can't. Because he's so focused on the Lord that nothing is going to stop him. That should be us. And lastly, we looked at patience is seen in how we live. That we're honest people and we do what we say we're going to do. And what a witness of the Lord to others that is. Because the, he's coming back. Let me, I'll just share this story with you and then I'll, I promise I will close. It's a story that Harry Hines tells regarding former President John F. Kennedy. He said during his 1960 presidential campaign, John F. Kennedy often closed his speeches with the story of Colonel Davenport, the Speaker of the Connecticut House of Representatives. On May 19, 1780, the sky of Hartford darkened ominously, and some of the representatives, glancing out the windows, feared the end was at hand. Quelling a clamor of immediate adjournment, Davenport rose and said, the day of judgment is either approaching or it is not. If it is not, there is no cause for adjournment. If it is, I choose to be found doing my duty. Therefore, I wish that candles be brought. Rather than fearing what was to come, we are to be faithful till Christ returns. Instead of fearing the dark, we're to be lights as we watch and wait. Absolutely. You know, the day of judgment is coming whether people believe it or not. Do you really think, oh, well, no one believes that I'm coming back, so I won't. Are you kidding me? He said he's coming back. That's just the way it is. And thus, we should want to live out our faith in such a way that it not only blesses people, but it honors the Lord. You see, no matter what, guys, no matter what we are going through, no matter how difficult it will be, it may be, our faith endures, right? Our faith endures. Let's pray. Father, we do pray for that. We pray that our faith would endure to the very end. Lord, our heart's desire is to honor you in all that we do, to have the patience, Father, keeping our eyes on you, knowing that the world is a difficult world. But Lord, you're with us. You will never leave us. You will never forsake us. And we're so thankful for that. And Lord, help us to honor you in our words, our actions, that people see your love in our lives, that the fruit of spirit would flow, not the works of the flesh. We love you so much and we thank you and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.